All right. So thank you for uh, to Ron Meesing. That was wonderful. Like I mentioned at the beginning, uh, you may recognize Ron from our uh, 120th anniversary video that we launched last month. Uh, if you haven't seen the video yet, I'd encourage you to visit www.carnegiecarnegie.org and see what we have in the works here for completing the Carnegie Carnegie. Uh, so welcome back, everyone. Um, so glad that everyone here was able to join us. It's been about 14 or 15 months since we've been able to meet here in person. And as you'll notice, I am not Diane. Uh, for those of you who haven't been watching our second Saturday Zooms, as we had to pivot online with the pandemic, um, my name is John Eric Gillot, and I am the new curator here at the Captain Thomas Espy Post and the uh, Andrew Carnegie Free Library and Music Hall. Uh, I interned here over a decade ago under Diane when I was a graduate student. Um, Diane has been my mentor, my friend for many years, so when she told me that she was ready to retire and asked if I might be interested, I jumped at the opportunity. Um, it's been wonderful being back here, seeing old faces, meeting new faces, getting to meet all of our wonderful docent core. Um, so you know, if, you, if you're one of our regular Second Saturday attendees, um, make sure you come afterwards and grab me and introduce yourself. I really want to meet everyone, get to know everyone. Uh, I have just a few announcements here before we get started. Uh, so in addition to to all of you that are here. Uh, we're also attempting for the first time to stream this event to, live to Facebook and to Zoom. Um, so for those of you who are watching out there in internet land, uh, please bear with us if we experience any technical difficulties, uh, but especially also shoot us a message to let us know if you're having any trouble hearing anything or seeing anything, uh, and we'll try to get that corrected for you. Uh, tours of the Captain Thomas SB Post are ongoing every Saturday from 11 a.m. to 3 p.m. If you haven't been over there yet this morning, I'd encourage you to stop by after today's lecture. Uh, likewise, be sure to visit the Lincoln Gallery right next door to the SB Post. Uh, if this is your first time here at the Andrew Carnegie Free Library and Music Hall, uh, find me uh, or Maggie here uh, or Diane afterwards, and we'll be happy to show you over to the Post and to the Lincoln Gallery. And also be sure to speak with members of the 9th Pennsylvania who are here. Here. Several of them have come in, but they've had a table set up outside. Uh, they've been doing a, a spring meeting and uh, recruiting drive, so please uh, go say hello to them. Uh, on June 21st, the Greater Pittsburgh Civil War Roundtable will be holding a Zoom lecture with Chris George uh, on his book, Day by Day with the 123rd Pennsylvania Volunteers. More information is available on their Facebook page. Uh, as usual, after today, even though this is our first month back, uh, we'll be taking our usual summer break for July and August. Uh, however, on June 29th, uh, we will be having a Facebook Live event with Rich Condon at Civil War Pittsburgh. Uh, we're going to be working on an occasional series focusing on the Grand Army of the Republic in Allegheny County. Naturally, we're going to start here with the Captain Thomas SB Post. So Rich, uh, with Civil War Pittsburgh, he will relate some of the origins of the Grand Army of the Republic in Allegheny County. Uh, Diane Kleinfelter will be with us. She'll discuss some of the history of the SB Post and the restoration of the post room. And then I'll be highlighting some of the personalities and the veterans who called the SB Post home uh, with a focus on some of the guys who you've likely never heard of. So it should be a good program. I hope you're able to join us. Uh, but otherwise, we won't be meeting back here until Saturday, September 11th. Uh, at that point and moving forward, we will plan to meet back in the Lincoln Gallery in our usual meeting spot. Uh, we're also planning to have a large Civil War book sale for September 11th in conjunction with the second Saturday speaker. Uh, over the past several years, we've received numerous uh, books, both from other libraries and from collectors, um, but books that you know we either already have in the collection or that simply don't fit within the scope of our collection. So the plan is to have a large book sale, um, talking hundreds and hundreds of Civil War books for sale. Uh, we want to move these, and we're in, they're going to be priced 
waste move. Uh, so please make sure you come and check that out. And all the funds raised from this uh, will go towards uh, preservation of the SP Post artifacts. So our September speaker on September 11th, the next time we meet back here, will be Maria McKelvey. Maria is a writer and an independent researcher from Wheeling. She'll be speaking on Confederate Lieutenant Colonel John A. Washington III. Uh, Washington was the great grandnephew of George Washington. Uh, he was the last of the Washington line to own Mount Vernon uh, before he sold it to the Mount Vernon Ladies Association in 1858. Uh, Washington was a beloved aide to General Robert E. Lee, and he was killed early in the war near Cheat Mountain and just devastated Lee. Uh, so Maria, will, you know, it's a really interesting talk. It's one of my favorite Civil War lectures I've ever heard. So I'd encourage you to come back uh, on September 11th and check that out. So for today's speaker, uh, a Civil War historian, Dr. Zach Kalsert, holds a PhD in history from West Virginia University, where he also received his master's degree. He earned his bachelor's degree in history and political science from Centenary College of Louisiana in Shreveport. Zach's dissertation explored the American Civil War in Indian Territory, which is modern-day Oklahoma, and his research interests include the Civil War in Trans-Mississippi, Southern Unionism, and the interactions between Civil War armies and newspaper presses. His research has been published in the Chronicles of Oklahoma, North Louisiana History, and Hallowed Ground, which is the magazine of the American Battlefield Trust. He teaches classes in U.S. history and modern military history at WVU. So ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. Zach Kauser. And, uh, before we get going here, as usual, we're going to have our speaker draw uh, the tickets for the raffle. We have four prizes down here, so as your name is drawn, if you'd like to come up and pick which one you want, this is your chance. I'm reading the name? Yep. All right, we've got uh, Mike Anthony. All right, there we go, Mike. And, uh, uh, Maggie F. Maggie? <laughs> Maggie! <laughs> sure. Bob P? Father Bob? Father Bob? There he is. And last one. Same one again. <laughs> Terry McGrath. Terry, wonderful. All right. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Well, welcome. Uh, first off, I want to thank John Eric uh, and everyone here for, for having me. It's, it's an honor and a pleasure. Um, if you haven't checked out that, you all probably have, but if you haven't checked out that GAR post, uh, uh, do so. It's, it's amazing. Uh, I was telling John Eric, I don't, I don't think I've ever stepped back in time quite so distinctly uh, as when I entered that room. So, so it's pretty amazing. Uh, yeah, so I want to begin by thanking everyone for coming out. A little history, a little music, you can't go wrong. Um, my name is uh, Zach Kausert. Uh, I'm from WVU, from Morgantown. Um, and today I'll be talking to you all about the Raleigh County Scouts in Southern West Virginia and the West Virginia State Guard in the Civil War, particularly uh, from 1863 to 1865. And before I sort of dive into um, my talk, I want to make one quick prefatory comment, which is that um, this is a project that is relatively new to me. Uh, I've been working on this uh, through COVID, uh, and so this is very much a work in progress. So in many ways, you guys are my guinea pigs today, uh, revealing what I have, but there are also questions that I don't have answers to um, yet. So this is, this is something that I'm actively working on. I'm excited. Ar archives are starting to open up, so I'm hoping to find some answers. But, but just be aware, you're, you're, you're getting a peek into a work in, in progress here, but I'm excited to, to share with you. Beautiful. On November 2nd, 1864, Captain William Turner, pictured here, and I apologize, this is the only photograph we have of him from a Beckley newspaper in the 1950s. Um, but on November 2nd, 1864, Captain William Turner of the Raleigh County Scouts, West Virginia State Guard, sat down to write his monthly report to West Virginia Governor Arthur Borman. 
The young captain had much to disclose in his report. The highlight of the previous month's activity was a sharp clash with Confederate raiders in Raleigh County on October 21st. Over 400 cavalrymen and a small detachment of infantry attacked the Raleigh County Scouts' primary base, a small fort they had built at the Forks of Coal River. With only 26 men on hand, Captain Turner led a valiant defense of the fort for over an hour before finally running short of ammunition. Quote, I was compelled to abandon my fort or suffer myself and my men to be captured, Turner confessed to the governor. Yet the Unionist scouts got their revenge the next day. Knowing the rebel raiders' likely avenue of travel as they passed through the county, Turner prepared an ambush along the roadway. Quote, the next morning I divided the 26 men I had into four different squads and sent them to take position near the road. The Confederates came along the next morning consoling each other and talking of the great and decisive victory they had won the previous evening. Then the old bushwhacking began in earnest. The Raleigh County Scouts sprung their trap and killed several Confederate soldiers. Despite the loss of their base, Turner proudly reported that, quote, I hadn't a man touched, while the enemy suffered eight killed and 20 wounded. Captain William Turner and the Raleigh County Scouts constituted one of over 40 state guard companies raised by West Virginia during the Civil War. And although much has been written about the Civil War in West Virginia and guerrilla warfare in Appalachia, the importance of the state guard in battling Confederate guerrillas and enforcing the newly created state of West Virginia's authority has really kind of gone unnoticed by, by many historians. And so in today's talk, I'd like to, to share with you my ongoing research into the state guard, why, were they, why they were created, what role they played in the war. And in exploring these questions, we'll use Raleigh County as, um, uh, as a sort of uh, case study, uh, a micro example. And again, I cannot stress enough that this is a work in progress for me. Uh, we'll have time for questions at the end, and I hope you ask questions I can't answer uh, uh, because, because I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about this project in lots of, of different ways. So uh, here's our, our outline. I always like to give folks a roadmap of what we're going to do. I want to start today by talking a little bit about the antebellum militia um, and its problems uh, in, in the Civil War. We'll talk a little bit about the United States Army and its presence in Raleigh County uh, and the limitations they have in fighting guerrillas. We'll then talk about the State Guard collectively uh, as sort of a state organization. And then finally, we'll utilize Raleigh County and, and William Turner's Raleigh County Scouts as a model to to unpack the experiences and responsibilities. What was it like to be a state guard uh, soldier in the field? And, and again, we'll have uh, time for questions at the end. I do want to make uh, a quick note on names because we're going to talk about militia, we talk about home guard, we talk about state guard. What is the difference between all of these things? Um, the, the militia, the antebellum militia that existed up to and then through the Civil War was comprised of every able-bodied white male of military age in Virginia. Uh, so if you were a white guy, you belonged to the antebellum militia. But by the time of the Civil War, the militia has atrophied a bit. It's become a, a, a pretty social organization. It doesn't have a lot of uh, military experience. And as we shall see, the militia is going to prove very uh, problematic uh, in, in state service. So there are problems with the militia that necessitate a better, more professional military force. Certainly the State Guard constituted a uh, home guard. And so when we talk about home guard, we're usually referring to troops that were raised for emergency service, 30 days, 60 days, 90 days, um, with the expectation that these are sort of short-term emergency troops. We could categorize the State Guard as Home Guard, but there are some important differences, and that's why I kind of use the capital S, capital G, State Guard distinction here. Because unlike militia and Home Guard, the West Virginia State Guard were local forces who enlisted full-time on behalf of the state of West Virginia. So they signed enlistment papers for one year. They are essentially full-time soldiers, not in federal service, not in United States service, but in for the state of West Virginia. Uh, and their primary responsibilities are to fight Confederate guerrillas and sort of bolster state authority. So they're kind of a unique organization because they're a full-time force fighting for West Virginia as opposed to, to the Union. Okay, enough sort of prefatory stuff. Let's dive in. 
Let's talk a little bit about Raleigh County, which is in the southern half of, of West Virginia, for those of you who, who may not be familiar, sort of uh, south, a little bit southeast of, of Charleston. Um, so we should know a little something about Raleigh County as we talk about it today. In 1860, Raleigh County had a population of about 3,300. It was overwhelmingly white. Uh, there were only 61 enslaved blacks and a few free blacks in the county. The rugged county was small and rural, and most folks were subsistence farmers. So the other thing to note here is there's not a large slave population. This is not a county that has many plantations. This is uh, uh, a really kind of a poor, rural, out-of-the-way county. Raleigh Courthouse, uh, which is also known as Beckley, uh, was the county seat. And for the most part, Raleigh County uh, had relatively, and I'm going to skip ahead to give us a map here. Uh, so we see, oh, beautiful. We, <laughs> we see Raleigh County here, right? Uh, courthouse is, is Beckley, uh, which during the Civil War, it goes by both. Uh, some people did refer to it as Beckley uh, or Beckley Courthouse. Some folks refer, referred to it as Raleigh Courthouse. Um, so we can see Kanawha County up here. Um, Charleston is just off our map to the north, right? So kind of giving us a little bit of, uh, uh, get us situated here. Lewisburg's off to our to our east. Uh, Virginia is, is hovering down uh, off our map. Politically, this was a fairly moderate county. In 1860, Raleigh followed the rest of Virginia the rest of Virginia in supporting John Bell and the Constitutional Union Party, which was sort of seen as the, the moderate party in the South. Uh, Lincoln and the Republicans received zero votes in Raleigh County, unsurprisingly. The county sent delegates to the Secession Convention in Richmond, and their delegate Henry Gillespie voted in favor of secession, although reluctantly. He said that, quote, it fell, the, the secession ordinance fell on my ears like an avalanche. Um, and when the secession ordinance was put to the people for a vote, Raleigh citizens only mildly voted in favor of secession. So you can see the breakdown here. 229 voted in uh, for secession, but 184 uh, voted uh, against secession. So Raleigh is very much a divided county, right? 45% of the county did not want to leave uh, the Union, and that thus there are strong pockets of unionism in Raleigh County throughout the war. Ultimately, both the U.S. and Confederate armies will recruit troops from Raleigh County. Um, and so overall, this is, you know, Raleigh, I think, is representative of, of many West Virginia counties, frankly, in the sense that it is rural, uh, not deeply invested in the institution of slavery, and very politically divided as the Civil War begins. So in July of 1861, federal forces invade the Kanawha River Valley. And following a clash at Scary Creek on July 17th, uh, Charleston, um, Virginia, West Virginia, Western Virginia, is occupied in July. Confederate forces retreated towards uh, Lewisburg, towards the east. Just south of Charleston, citizens in Raleigh County feared invasion and occupation by the U.S. Army as summer turned into autumn. As local resident Sally Davis confided to a friend and, quote, there is a continued excitement about here for fear that the Yankees will overrun this section of the country. Raleigh resident William Sewell Dunbar, who we'll talk more about in a moment, recalled the same sort of excitement, remembering that, quote, the cry of the Yankees are coming was heard from every corner. Hoping to defend Raleigh County from federal incursions, local Confederate county authorities attempted to call out the local militia uh, around autumn, August, um, September of 1861. And among these called to rally the Raleigh militia was William Sewell Dunbar. Dunbar was a lieutenant in the antebellum, although now wartime, I guess, Virginia militia. But Dunbar was placed in an impossible situation. He was a unionist. He was a supporter of the United States. He was a well-known unionist in the county. A lot of men viewed him with suspicion because he favored the union. And he was now, as an officer in the militia, being asked to call out the militia to oppose the United States Army, right? So what's he going to do? Dunbar initially tries to wiggle his way out of it. Um, uh, county authorities threaten him with uh, imprisonment if he doesn't do his duty. You've got to call out the militia or we're throwing you in jail. So he agrees to notify the men in his company, in his militia company, that they would muster the next day, right? So he's going around the neighborhood telling men, tomorrow we're going to meet and, and there's going to be a militia muster. 
Um, this is his uh, recollection of the event. Quote, I told every man my business and what had happened. And after I notified them, I took care to tell each one that they could do as they pleased. Go or leave it alone, giving them to understand that I did not care about their going. And if they did not go, I had no intentions of trying to force them to do so. Right? So a really uh, convincing speech on behalf of the militia. The militia musters the next day. And the men who arrived are expecting to march to Raleigh Courthouse, Beckley. And um, Dunbar is there. Most of the militia appears to have rallied. And a very zealous pro-secessionist neighbor goes up to Lieutenant Dunbar and says, you should give a speech to the men. Um, and this secessionist neighbor must not have known much about Dunbar. This is a bad request. Because Dunbar does give a speech, but it's not the one that many of the men were expecting. This is what he had to say. It was folly for us to go out and fight because the South could not establish her confederacy. And that if we ran off from our homes and joined the rebels, that when the Yankees, as they called them, came, they would not protect us or our property. And not only that, but it was wrong to rebel. I also told them that they could do as they chose, but for my part, I was not going out, nor was I going to fight for the South. And if I had to fight, it would be for the Union. I said I was going to Charleston forthwith to join the Federal Army. I got off of my, my post. He's He's literally on the stump. Uh, I was standing on and started down the road in the direction of Charleston. As Dunbar begins marching off to Charleston in front of what has to be a fairly shocked group of men, um, fellow militiamen begin to fall in with him, quote, until, until nearly all left and not a man went to the rebels. Upon reaching Charleston, Dunbar and 46 fellow men enlisted in Company H of the 8th West Virginia Infantry, which will later be the 7th West Virginia Cavalry, and Dunbar was elected a captain. It's worth noting that included in the ranks of Company H were William Turner, the future captain of the Raleigh County Scouts, and Jehu Dickens, the, the future first sergeant of the Raleigh County Scouts. William Dunbar's exodus from Raleigh County alongside his fellow unionists in 1861 highlights the political and military unreliability of the antebellum militia. Simply put, the Confederacy called out the militia to fight off the Yankees, and then a whole militia company joins the Yankees, right? So the reality is, is that in many counties, the militia was just unreliable because if the militia is everybody and uh, the, everybody is divided, <laughs> the political, the, the county population is divided between the Union and Confederacy, you know, how can you rely on them as a military force? So the militia is not going to be able to combat guerrillas effectively or really be called out by either side very effectively throughout the course of the war. In November of 1861, those Yankees finally show up in Raleigh County. Soldiers of the 23rd Ohio Infantry occupy Raleigh County. They occupy, and they literally actually occupy the courthouse. The men sleep in the courthouse. Uh, and they will occupy Raleigh County throughout the winter of 1861 and 1862. Um, some of you may be familiar, the 23rd Ohio is a pretty famous regiment uh, because it has two future presidents of the United States in its ranks, including Lieutenant Colonel Rutherford B. Hayes, here, William McKinley, who's like a commissary sergeant at the time. There's also a future Supreme Court justice in its ranks. It's kind of an amazingly future political regiment. Um, and Rutherford B. Hayes uh, kept an extensive diary throughout the Civil War. He wrote letters home to his wife and friends often. And those window, those, <laughs> those letters and the diaries give us a window into the guerrilla warfare that plagued Raleigh County and border counties um, uh, early in the war. Um, so the 23rd Ohio is going to spend much of this winter of 61 and 62 fighting guerrillas. How do they do it? Well, the basic tactic to fight guerrillas is to go on patrol, which they all call scout. We went on a scout. Uh, a scout is usually a multi-day uh, um, patrol throughout the county. Uh, usually a, a dozen or two men, commanded by junior officers, uh, roving Raleigh County in search of Confederate guerrillas, sympathizers, uh, and the like. As one Ohio officer noted, quote, the object was to give the lieutenant's experience and an independent command of men, to thoroughly learn the topography and geography of the country, and to have the inhabitants see that, that we were rather decent fellows and we didn't wear horns, right? The Yankees aren't so bad. But such patrols, uh, you know, 
this is essentially counterinsurgency, right? We're trying to quash Confederate guerrillas, quickly began to run into resistance. In January of 1862, a Union patrol visited the house of a well-known secessionist supporter, a guy named Shoemate. And although Shoemate was not there, his wife was. Federal soldiers searched the home, Shoemate isn't here, they're about to leave, and as they're about to leave, one of the Yankee soldiers says, hey, can I take some firewood with me? He asks the wife, can I take some firewood? Um, and she rather ominously replies, you'll find it warm enough before you get away. Sure enough, as the, as the Federals return to camp, they are ambushed by 30 Confederate guerrillas. Uh, they manage to escape, although not without some wounds and horses lost. In March of 62, Confederate guerrilla attacks increased, likely in part to the, due to the formation of a local guerrilla band known as the, quote, Flat Top Copperheads, named after Flat Top Mountain in Raleigh County. Several guerrilla attacks on Union patrols left four dead, several more wounded or prisoner. In his diary, Hayes wrote, quote, I think this man of scouting or patrolling, very objectionable. Six to ten men every morning, about the same hour, have been in the habit of riding out six to ten miles on this road. Nothing was easier than to lay an ambush for them. And so in response, recognizing the vulnerability of his men, Hayes ordered that the patrols were, quote, to scout at irregular intervals on routes changed daily, and an infantry party will be sent in the general direction uh, of apprehended danger to skirmish the woods and by roads, right? So Hayes is realizing our patrol are getting ambushed, we need to change things up, right? We need to be unpredictable, we need to have infantry support nearby. In short, he's sort of growing as a commander and figuring out some effective counterinsurgency tactics. Of course, as we know, not everybody in Raleigh County supported the secessionists. There were unionists, but the unionists prove a tricky, unpredictable lot for Lieutenant Colonel Hayes. Union men rarely stayed at their homes in Raleigh County. Because they were a minority, they often slept and hid in the woods, um, so they would come home during the day, but at night, uh, where they, during, during the day where they could sort of see and get forewarning, but at night they would go hide in the hills to avoid being attacked by guerrillas or to avoid being drafted by the Confederate Army. They knew, and it was well known, that if they uh, aided the Union Army in any way, they risked, they risked reprisals. And there were a number of assassinations in Raleigh County, sort of politically motivated assassinations throughout the war. As Hayes noted, none of these Unionists are perfectly reliable. They will do what is necessary necessary to protect their property. The 23rd Ohio found battling guerrillas a hard, tiresome business, a brutal game of scouting, ambushes, and wary citizens. But Hayes felt that they had made some headway. Uh, in late March, he wrote in his diary that, quote, as a general rule, we get the better of the bushwhackers in these affairs. There is no hesitation on our part in doing what seems to be required for self-protection. Since writing the note enclosed, we have done a great deal towards punishing the cowardly bushwhackers. While the Ohioans may have found some success that winter, they leave. <laughs> they march uh, out of Raleigh County in April and May, and this is the last time that any permanent United States military force will be stationed in Raleigh County. Thus, the 20th of Ohio and Hayes' experience in Raleigh tell us two things. One, uh, it's difficult to quash guerrillas, but it can be done. But second, the U.S. Army isn't going to do it, right? The U.S. Army is busy fighting Robert E. Lee, trying to take Richmond. They've got bigger strategic fish to fry. So in a county like Raleigh that doesn't have a lot of strategic value, the U.S. Army isn't, essentially isn't going to waste its time. So from the spring of 1862 on, there is no U.S. Army presence in Raleigh, which leaves Raleigh citizens, particularly those Unionists, incredibly vulnerable to guerrillas. And this is where the State Guard comes in. West Virginia entered the Union on June 20th, 1863, and Arthur Ingram Borman, pictured here, a stout guy, I like his strong jaw, served as the state's first governor. Probably few, if any, uh, American governors have entered office facing so many challenges as, as Borman did. And all of Borman's, uh, Borman's, Borman's problems are essentially rooted in the fact that he either did not control or did not even have contact with vast portions of the state over which he governed. The reality is that many of Western Virginia's citizens still supported the Confederacy and were actively fighting against both West Virginia and the United States. In short, Borman presided over a state torn apart internally by civil war, and many of whose citizens denied West Virginia's legitimacy. 
So what are you going to do if you're Borman, right? You're the new governor of West Virginia, but whole portions of the state are essentially inaccessible to you. A place like Raleigh County, um, you have no contact with, you don't have any sort of military presence there, right? It's not safe uh, uh, to send men there and back uh, to travel routinely. So how is he going to reassert his authority over these far-flung regions of the newly created state of West Virginia? Um, Borman needs to find some way to challenge these Confederate guerrillas and local Confederate authorities for control, particularly of Southern West Virginia, and to assert the state of West Virginia's authority. And the answer that he comes to, and I'm gonna skip ahead to give some of the photograph. So again, we have Borman on the left. On the right, we have the Adjutant General of West Virginia. This is Francis Perry Pierpont. He is the nephew of Francis Harrison Pierpont, the governor of uh, restored Virginia, Union Virginia, if you will. These two men uh, are, are the guys who are going to come up with the, the idea of the state guard. They talked about and considered using the militia, but as, as Pierpont simply noted, quote, it was impossible to muster the militia in a large number of the counties before the suppression of the rebellion. So as long as the Civil War is going on, the militia is, is ineffective to us. Instead, they decide to establish independent companies of West Virginia State Guard, quote, organized in the border counties of the state for the protection of such counties against the marauding bands of guerrillas which have continually infested them since the commencement of the war. As Pierpont noted, quote, this service is very arduous and dangerous and such only as can be successfully accomplished by men, excuse me, who have lived in the country, who are thoroughly acquainted with it and the inhabitants. So in short, we're going to raise local men of unionists. And the advantage of using local men is that they know the countryside, right? They know the roads, they know the trails, they know the topography, but they also know the human geography. They know who's a unionist, they know who's a society. They know which families are likely supporting guerrillas or where guerrillas are coming from, right? These are the kinds of men uh, uh, who can fight Confederate guerrillas. Um, the first companies of State Guard were approved in the summer of 1863, and a total of uh, as at latest count, a total of 44 companies served in 31 West Virginia counties between the summer of 1863 and 1865. And I'll give us a, a brief map here. So every county, and this is a modern map, so a few of these counties don't exist yet um, in 1863, but every county with a dot here has an independent home guard company. So you can see they're kind of clustered in the center and southern portions of the state. So, what were the responsibilities of the State Guard? The W archives contains a letter from Adjutant General Pierpont to Captain Samson Snyder of Randolph County, granting him permission to raise a State Guard company. And this letter is important because it's one of the few letters we have from Wheeling, from Borman, from Pierpont to the Home Guard. We have a lot of correspondence from the Home Guard to Wheeling. We don't have another, we don't have a lot coming the other way. But this letter is important because it outlines the expectations for the units. And this is what Pierpont says. So this is the responsibility of the State Guard. Quote, it will be your duty to keep the country well scouted and as far as practicable cleared of guerrillas and bushwhackers and if possible entirely exterminate them. You will be required to be on duty all the time and keep a vigilant watch in the county, having men in different parts of the county upon whom you can rely to keep you advised all the time. In the case of a formidable invasion, you are to inform the nearest military post and cooperate as far as practical with the U.S. forces. Pierpont further noted in his letter that the governor uh, had the right to dismiss State Guard officers at all time at his discretion and further warned, quote, you will strictly observe the right of private citizens in the protection of their property and prevent anything like pillaging and plundering by your men. And this was a major concern as Borman um, and Pierpont create these companies, right? Because you're essentially, if you look at Raleigh County, for example, if you look at William Turner, you're essentially uh, authorizing this one man to recruit a company, and they're going to be the eyes, ears, and authority of the state of West Virginia, right? So you want them to be responsible men. They're very nervous that these home guard companies um, uh, might go rogue, turn wild, and start plundering or pillaging, carrying out vendettas, um, etc. cetera. 
uh, muster rolls were to be submitted for these companies to the Adjutant General, and monthly reports every month were to be submitted directly to Governor Borman. And this is where I've uh, discovered almost everything I know about the State Guard is from these monthly reports that are being sent uh, to Wheeling. So in sum, Borman and Adjutant General Pierpont expected the State Guard to quash guerrilla activity and serve as the eyes and ears in the border counties. But as we shall see as we look at Raleigh County specifically, exigencies on the ground often forced these State Guard units to grapple with unexpected political and military matters. They had to deal with Confederate deserters, parolees, determining citizens' political loyalties, administering the oath of allegiance, clashing with regular Confederate forces, recovering stolen property, ferreting out weapons caches, and perhaps even politicking on behalf of Governor Borman, President Lincoln, and the Republican Party. Thus, these state guard companies, yeah, they're quashing guerrillas, uh, but they're also in many ways establishing the state of West Virginia's authority. And before we finally turn to Captain Turner's scouts, we should talk a little bit about what these companies actually looked like. How were they composed? Companies generally ranged from 25 to 75 men, usually 50. They were commanded by a captain with a lieutenant and, and or sergeants in support. Men enlisted for a period of one year. Thus, they differed from militia or home guard, right? Because these are essentially full-time soldiers, not emergency troops. But again, they're fighting on behalf of West Virginia, not the Union Army. Uh, that said, the men, because they are essentially from the counties in which they are serving, they oftentimes get to go home. They receive furloughs quite regularly, which is a nice perk. Um, enlistment in the state State Guard made men exempt from the draft, which was an alluring uh, uh, bonus for many men. Captains were paid $50 a month, sergeants 14, privates 13, and in fact, uh, the state of West Virginia pegged the pay of State Guard to the U.S. Army. So if you were enlisted in the West Virginia State Guard, you were earning the exact same amount as a, a, a private in, say, the Army of the Potomac. So you can see why if you're a young man and the average age was about 28, if you're a 28-year-old man in Raleigh, County, uh, this is a pretty good deal, right? Um, because you're not going to be drafted. You don't have to go fight in the trenches of Petersburg or, or Wilderness or, or Spotsylvania Courthouse in, in the Overland Campaign, right? You get to stay home. You get to see your family. You get to sleep uh, at night uh, in your own bed, right? But you're making the same pay. Uh, it's worth noting these companies are outfitted by the U.S. Army. So you're wearing Union Blue. You're carrying a Springfield musket. Uh, uh, it's not. It's not a bad. Not a bad deal. They're a lot of perks. So let's actually talk about the Raleigh County Scouts so we can get a sense of how these men operated on the ground. In January 1864, Governor, Governor Borman authorized William Turner of Raleigh County to raise a company of State Guard comprised of 50 men. As Turner wrote, quote, my motive in raising this independent company for Raleigh County is a pure one, i.e. to protect the citizens and their property against the predatory bands of thieves and guerrillas that infest our county and plunder obedient citizens. Turner was a good choice. He was only 24 years old. He had served in the 8th uh, Virginia Infantry uh, early in the war. He was sworn in by William Dunbar, that militia officer who, who marched out of Raleigh in 1861. Uh, he was wounded, uh, Turner was wounded at, in the shoulder at the Battle of Cross Keys. So he was a wounded veteran who wanted to continue to serve, but perhaps couldn't have uh, endured sort of army service. And this is something I've noted. Uh, a, a large number, I mean, I would probably guess 10 to 20 percent of Turner's company are uh, veterans, men whose terms of enlistment have expired in the army, uh, but they're willing to serve at home. Almost all of them are out of that 8th Virginia slash 7th West Virginia um, unit. Um, uh, the, cap the company's first lieutenant was Reverend Jehu Dickens, pictured here uh, on the far left in, in, in his uh, older age. He was a Methodist preacher, another veteran of the 8th Virginia who spent some time in Libby Prison in Richmond in the middle of the war. Turner and Dickens were respected by their men, quote, with the captain to do the cussing and the lieutenant to do the praying, we can go anywhere. Turner began raising his company in February of 64, operating from the relative safety of Kanawha County to the north. Um, 
so we can see Kana here. And since I'm already on the map, I'll show you. These two red circles are the two bases that the Raleigh County Scouts operate out of. So if you notice here, I mean, this is, this is Raleigh County. Um, there is a U.S. Army post right at Brownstown. So um, both of their bases at Lynn's Creek and then at the Forks of Coal, where they built that little fort that was attacked, um, essentially this is their pipeline, right? They go up to Brownstown to get ammunition, to get supplies, to check in with the U.S. Army. Then they move down to their base in Raleigh County, uh, in northern Raleigh County, and then they scout around the county um, as, as necessary. So Turner, in February, for the first time, ventures into Raleigh County to recruit men. This was not an easy task. To my mortification, I found the county infested with a number of rebel scouts on the look for me. I was compelled to use great secrecy and precaution in traveling around and searching the caverns of the mountains to find my men, who were compelled to secret themselves to avoid being carried off as prisoners or conscripted into Confederate service. So he's going into the hillsides to find those hidden Unionists. Yet he thought very highly of his men. Pretty much in every report that he writes to Governor Borman, he is praising uh, his men. I have no scruples. I have no scruples in saying so far that I have the best company of men ever recruited in this portion of West Virginia for the U.S. or state service. And such are the men required to contend against the guerrillas, midnight assassins, house robbers, burners, and every description of desperate men. By the end of 1864, Turner was appointed again to lead his company, whose district was expanded to include nearby McDowell and Wyoming counties. The company's size uh, was increased to 75 men. The company was dissolved in July of 1865. Around 70 to 100 men total served in the company over two years of service. Uh, the men were young, average age 28, overwhelmingly local farmers and, and local laborers. Uh, these were not men of wealth or property. A number of them, like Turner, were Union veterans. Uh, and again, uh, his men operated primarily from these two bases. The company's foremost goal throughout its 16, 17 months of service was to patrol or scout Raleigh County and suppress Confederate guerrillas, and this they did constantly. Although the November 1864 fight at the Forks of Coal River that I, I opened my talk with provided, proved an exciting affair, the reality is that most of these scouts were pretty mundane. Here's what Turner reported to Governor Borman on a fairly typical scouting expedition in April of 1865. I started out on a scouting expedition and was out in the counties of Wyoming Raleigh and McDowell for 12 days, traveled a distance of 200 miles, changed a few shots with a party of 10 guerrillas. On the 14th, I had the good fortune of capturing two Confederate prisoners, John and Henry Trump. One was a regular Confederate soldier, the other was a soldier at the commencement of the war and had since, had since been home on the Dodge from our scouts and stealing horses. I turned them over to the U.S. Provost Marshal at Brownstown. One particular notable success by Turner's men was the killing of Andrew Gonneau. Turner sent six men under the command of Pemberton, Quip, of Pemberton Cook, quote, for the purpose of waylaying and killing a notorious guerrilla by the name of Andrew Gonneau. Gonneau was a Confederate lieutenant and deserter who, Turner reported, quote, has murdered not less than four peaceable citizens, in my knowledge, and in the last year stole or destroyed $5,000 worth of property. On August 14, 1864, Pemberton Cook and his party of five men waited in the brush outside of Andrew Gonneau's home. Gonneau exited the house with his son, John, and the two walked up a nearby hillside to collect blackberries. As the two men climbed the hill, Pemberton and his scouts opened fire, sending seven shots through Andrew Gonneau's breast. John, the son, began to flee, and one of the Union party uh, cried out, for God's sakes, don't shoot the boy. And John was allowed to go free uh, and share the story uh, that we know today. And Gonneau's grave in fact still stands in Wyoming County. The death, the killing uh, of Andrew Gonneau, this, this uh, notorious guerrilla, was met, quote, all the loyal people of the border unite in praising Pemberton Cook and the boys for ridding the country of the pest who was universally dreaded where his name was known. 
besides for capturing, combating uh, guerrillas, uh, they routinely, the scouts routinely captured Confederate prisoners of war and deserters whom they generally turned over to the US military. They also captured at least one Confederate officer attempting to recruit men in Raleigh County. Occasionally, the State Guard uh, captured property, but Turner enforced a strict policy to quote, capture no property unless it is from the rebels actually in arms against the United States or this state. So he seems to have taken Pierpont and Borman's words to heart. Perhaps the most interesting to me uh, aspect of Turner's state guards um, are his occasional references to his political activities on behalf of Governor Borman, President Lincoln, and the Republican Party. There are two quotes I want to read to you from his reports. He says this, writing to Governor Borman, I was very happy to see your name announced in the local newspaper as a candidate for the honorable and responsible office of Governor of West Virginia. No choice the people could make, could make would be more consistent with my feelings as an individual. By hoping old Uncle Abraham will, will take the sway uh, by the overwhelming majority, speedily suppress this infamous rebellion on the terms of an unconditional surrender. Okay, so Turner is a supporter of Bob Borman. He's hoping that Lincoln is reelected in 64. We got it. He's a Republican. But his next report says this. I have administered the oath of allegiance to quite a number of citizens. So by the time of the presidential election this fall, the county of Raleigh will give old Uncle Abraham a unanimous vote where he received not one four years ago. Now, this is an interesting quote to me, right? Because it suggests that he's using his military and political authority uh, to influence Raleigh County citizens uh, to vote for Lincoln. How is he doing this? Is he saying vote for Lincoln? Is he saying vote for Lincoln? <laughs> we don't know, right? Um, but I think it's it's interesting because it suggests that these state guard were perhaps political agents on behalf of the Republican Party. It's also worth noting that Raleigh County didn't submit election returns for the election of 1864, so we don't know how effective this politicking was. In July of 1865, the Raleigh County scouts disbanded and the men headed home. Captain Turner proclaimed, oh sorry, Captain Turner proclaimed, I shall retire to private life with the full self-assurance that I have been equal to the emergency through the struggle for the perpetuity of American government. And I have the indulgent hope that I have the confidence and in my superior officers, my men, and the loyal people whom I have rescued and stood between the foe for the last 16 months. He doesn't think, uh, he thinks quite a bit of himself and, and his men. Certainly, the state government seems to have thought highly of uh, the state guard. West Virginia adjutant Francis Pierpont wrote at the end of 1865, it cannot be doubted that they have rendered very efficient service in the counties for which they were organized. They have been a great protection to the loyal people of the border counties and have aided materially in the enforcement of the civil laws therein, without which those counties must have been abandoned by the loyal people. Um, we should note, however, uh, that the records, all the records we have speak glowingly of the State Guard, but secessionists and Confederate citizens certainly felt differently, right? So we should perhaps take, perhaps take a grain of salt uh, when, we, when we read these words of praise for the West Virginia State Guard. And on that note, uh, I, will, I will be quiet, uh, and I will welcome uh, any questions uh, or comments that you all might have. Thank you so much for, for listening. Sixty-three. Um, so the question was, when uh, does West Virginia secede from Virginia? Oh no! This okay. So this is a good. No, that's a great that's a great point. So when I'm using the term secessionist, I mean those who I mean Confederates, those who who wanted to secede from the Union. Um, so early, you know, kind of to boil it down as succinctly, um, early in in the war. Um, there is a movement to create a loyal Virginia, the restored government of Virginia. Um, so not Confederate Virginia, but loyal Virginia. Uh, and this is headed by Francis Harrison Pierpont, who is governor. But 
while, while restored Virginia exists, there is a movement to create a separate state uh, um, of West Virginia. And West Virginia uh, officially comes into being in, in June of 1863. And that's how we get Governor Borman. Um, no, it's a, it's a great question. It's a good question. Uh, yes, sir. Oh, well, uh, so the question was: Are the guards mounted, or are they on, or are they on foot? That's a very good question. So I think <laughs> I'm going to be honest with you. I think it might depend by county. Uh, I get the suspicion that most of Turner's men are not mounted, um, but he, in his requisitions to the state, he notes that that he has purchased some local horses and he also requisitions the use of a wagon to take supplies back and forth between his bases. It's hard to imagine that they're scouting on foot, right? I mean, if they're patrolling Raleigh County, I think they almost have to be um, mounted. Maybe not every man has a horse. There seems to be a collective nature, but, but they have to... Ha I can't imagine that they're not mounted to a degree. Um, so it's, it's a good question. Uh, I think they're, I think it's sort of um, a bit of both. I think it's a bit of both. Yes, sir. Wait, what? Yeah, so, um, and correct me if I, if I misheard you, the gentleman's question was, um, isn't it true that sort of Eastern Panhandle and Southern West Virginia counties had, had many men in Confederate service, is, is that right? Uh, yes, that's true. Um, you know, if you look at Raleigh County, from, from what we can tell from, from uh, muster rolls, but also from county histories, more men out of, Ra out of Raleigh fought for, for the Confederacy than for the Union, and that's true, I think, I suspect that's true for many Southern West Virginia counties. I mean. We should we should be honest. Uh, when West Virginia is created, there are certainly counties in the state that are you know very pro Confederate, pro secessionist. Um, so some of these counties are are pulled into West Virginia by force and politics and law, as opposed necessarily to political sentiment. If that makes sense. Um, but I but I will say, I mean, I think one of the reasons I chose Raleigh is I think it's a it's an interesting county because even though it is a Southern West Virginia county, it and every Every county that it neighbored voted for secession. Um, you know, the final breakdown is 55-45, right? So there's a lot, there is a substantial healthy unionist minority in the southern part of the state, but I think it is fair to say that for many counties in the southern part of the state, they are pro-Confederate. Um, uh, yeah. Okay. Which county, I'm sorry? Tyler. Um, I have no idea. <laughs> I, yeah, I, I don't know about Tyler offhand. Um, I don't know. I, I will tell you a great um, source for me as I kind of work my way through these these documents are, are county histories. And a lot of these county histories are pre-1920, which means they are free online. The copyright is expired. And so a lot of times you can find uh, old county histories that are very, I mean, they're full, they're very anecdotal, but they're full of great information on the experiences of, of citizens um, uh, during, during the war. I mean, that killing of Andrew Gonneau, that story comes from sort of county lore that, that is recorded in county history, right? So, uh, you know, I don't know about Tyler County specifically, but I would maybe see if there are some old county, county history books that would, that would give you a sense of, of where they stood. The other thing I should mention really quickly is that um, all of the monthly reports of all of these, of all 44 state guard companies have been digitized uh, by the state archives. That's how I bumped into them originally. Um, so you, if you literally Google, you know, Union Militia West Virginia, because uh, they're all lumped in, in the militia records. The state guard are not militia, but they're all kind of lumped together. It's the first thing that pops up. So you could actually search by county as well. You could go and see, hey, is there a state guard company in Tyler County? And what are those monthly reports? look like um, so you can you can go to primary sources yourself which is uh, pretty cool I mean, pretty cool yes sir in the back just a weird question did the state guard evolve into what we now consider the national guard 
or did it go away and then come back as the National Guard? Yeah, so that's a great question. It is not going to become the National Guard. Um, yeah, that's, that's, that's the simple answer. Um, in, in, the State Guard is dissolved. I think by August of 65, all of them have been dissolved. In the post-Civil War years, um, the state will maintain a few, basically a few regiments of what we would think of as National Guard. The National Guard has not been created yet, but like there's still a first West Virginia infantry uh, by the time of the Spanish-American War, for example. Um, and then it's, in the, it's around that turn of the century that those uh, units become, become the National Guard. Uh, great question. Yeah, no, no connection between the two. Yes, sir. Yeah. 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 Um, so uh, the, the gentleman's question is sort of what are some of the other issues driving local politics for and against secession um, in Western Virginia during the Civil War besides slavery? Is that is that about right? Um, Woo. Uh, so it's a it's a great question. So Western Virginia, I can to be honest with you, I can answer it sort of better from from the Unionist perspective. Um, there had been a lot of frustration in the Western counties of Virginia throughout the antebellum era over issues of representation in the state government, um, and in particular because um, in Virginia slaves counted towards population, um, and of course Western Virginia doesn't have too many slaves. With the exception of the Kanawha River Valley, this is not a, a particularly large slaveholding region. And so from Western Virginia's perspective, uh, they're getting hooched because in the state government, all of these counties in, in Virginia, in Eastern Virginia, that don't have large white populations or that have moderate white populations, but have large enslaved populations um, are overrepresented, if you will, in the state government. So there was a general feeling that the state government is dominated by Eastern Eastern Virginia, they don't care about Western Virginia, they're not investing in terms of roadways and canals and industry in Western Virginia. So the statehood movement is in part, I mean, the secession and, and the, the formation of the Confederacy is sort of the spark that lights the powder keg. But there are a lot of kind of internal Virginia issues that are dividing sort of Western from Eastern Virginia. Um, from the sort of Confederate perspective, if you were a secessionist in Raleigh County, but you're probably not a slave ho slaveholder, why are you supporting the Confederacy? Um, what I would probably say is that um, even if someone isn't a slaveholder, the Confederacy is very good, especially in 61, the Confederacy is very good at inciting racial tensions in a way that encourage um, non white non-slaveholders to support the Confederacy. So if you look at editorials in Virginia newspapers and Southern newspapers in the summer of 61 or the spring of 61, you know, they are inflaming racial tensions. Radical black Republicans want racial equality. Black men are going to marry white women. I mean, they use sort of um, uh, fears of miscegenation and things like this. Um, so there's uh, sort of, I mean, honestly, there's sort of a propaganda campaign uh, that's being waged in the South that is, uh, I think, very, very influential on a lot of white um, Southern men. And of course, even if you aren't a slaveholder, it does not necessarily mean that you don't use slave labor, right? Slave labor is very common for slave labor to be rented out um, to other families, and, and actually that's particularly true in poor rural counties where most folks can't afford slaves, but if their neighbor has a slave and they can rent him out for, for you know, a month's labor, they'll do so. So, you know, I, I, would, I would argue that a sense of, of um, you know, loyalty to the state, but also the, the issue of slavery and race is still a motivating factor, even if one isn't a slave. Holder. Um, but it's a good question. And, and, I, and the answer I'm giving you, I think, is sort of broad. I think it's a good one for the South generally. I think, I think I could do more research into Raleigh specifically and why men in Raleigh County are, are adhering to the Confederacy, because maybe that answer is a little different if we looked at the county level. Yeah. 
Yes, ma'am. Yeah, so that's a fantastic question. Um, so the short answer is um, yes, or some, some of the border states did. Uh, I actually think the best comparison to West Virginia is Missouri. Um, Missouri will create the, the federal, so <laughs> Missouri has uh, the Missouri State Guard, which the Missouri State Guard is not really a home guard. Um, they're, they're basically a, they're basically Missouri's private Confederate army. <laughs> so if you look at Bass, if you look at battles like Wilson's Creek or Pea Ridge, you have the Confederate army, and then you have like full brigades and divisions of Missouri troops that have not enlisted in Confederate service, but have enlisted in the Missouri State Guard. Um, so I would argue there, like I would argue that the Missouri State Guard is, isn't even quite home guard; that they are essentially a private state army. On the Union side, however, um, Missouri will create the enrolled. Missouri Militia and the Missouri State Militia, the MSM and the EMM, and these are, I think, very comparable to the West Virginia State Guard. These are essentially, uh, I don't think they're organized by county, but they're organized by district, and these are basically state-level troops who are meant to secure sort of their region of the state, their, their district. Um, What's really interesting to me is how little has been written about Home Guard in the Civil War. Um, and so uh, as I simultaneously dig into West Virginia, I've actually begun sort of rooting around to see what I can find about Missouri so that I can sort of draw deeper com you know, contrasts and comparisons. But I think Missouri is probably the best example. It's worth noting that some of the Midwestern states, Indiana, for example, has the Indiana Legion, which is essentially a, a, a they're not full time, but they are an emergency home Guard organization. And so when Morgan, when John Hunt Morgan raids through the Midwest in 1863, that home guard is being called up to, to, to fight Morgan. Um, yeah, great question. Great question. Yes, sir. Um, so the question was, are the civil courts open and operating efficiently? Is, uh, did I hear you right? They are, um, it's a great question, they are operating under Confederate authority uh, until the end of 1861. Uh, then the Union Army occupies, and there is no civil authority. There was an attempt in 1863, um, there was actually an attempt briefly in 1863 um, uh, to, to create a Raleigh County militia to like enroll just every able-bodied white man. This does not go well, most people don't show up. Um, and so throughout 1863 the civil courts are closed. Um, throughout 1864 the civil courts are closed. And the, the only reason I can answer this, that I know this for sure, is that William Sewell Dunbar, that unionist from the beginning of my talk, he becomes the state senator for a district that includes Raleigh County. It includes a couple counties, but it includes Raleigh. And Sewell in the Westford, in the Wheeling Intelligencer, actually, there's a report uh, from, from Sewell that basically says nobody's been able to get married. <laughs> there have been no uh, birth and death records, that, that essentially nothing is going on in Raleigh. Uh, in the spring of 65, Turner writes to Borman and says, Governor Borman and says, there's been some demand here um, to reestablish civil authorities, and I think I can protect them if you do it. Uh, I don't have Borman's reply. <laughs> so I don't know exactly when civil authority returns to Raleigh, but basically from like uh, the spring, winter of 61, 62, until at least uh, the beginning of 1865, there are no consistent sort of local authorities in charge, um, which is, you know, really problematic, uh, as, as you might imagine, for lots of, you know, practical reasons. Um, yeah, and it's a good question, too, because, you know, I'd love to have Borman's response, and I suspect, you know, one of the challenges I'm working on is I've really focused on Raleigh County, but I'm trying to look at some other counties to get a sense of, is Raleigh representative uh, of, state, of the State Guard experience, or is Raleigh an outlier? Um, because I suspect there are a lot of other counties that would like to restore order, that would like to have civil authority, and so I, I don't know if, you know, I don't know if that's being reestablished elsewhere through the State Guard or not. Um, it's a good question. That's a good question. Is that a hand up in the back? 
No. Um, yes, sir. Yeah. Yeah, it's a it's a really good question. Um, depends on the county. So you know, I think uh, I have transcribed most of, of Wyoming County, for example, and Wyoming County is very very similar. And and actually, just a very interesting aside, Wyoming County is command. Their scouts are commanded by Captain Sa Captain Sanders Mullins. And at the end of 1864, there is a petition from the men in that company to the governor, and they say. Mullins isn't going on scout with us. <laughs> He's ordering us to go on scout, but he doesn't go on scout, and we want an officer who goes on scout. There's an expectation that they're going to lead from the front, which I find interesting. Um, but if you look at, at McDowell, if you look at, at Monroe, if you look at um, uh, Wyoming, they're very similar. Small populations, rural, not a lot of strategic value, not a, lot, not a large enslaved population. Kanawha uh, and Greenbrier are, are different stories. So if you look at Kanawha, the home guard, the, the state guard in Kanawha says, we actually can't get enough men to join the state guard because they're all enlisting in the U.S. Army, <laughs> right? Which also makes sense because the army's occupying, char I mean, the, the army has a presence there, right? So in some of these bigger counties, the state guard can't form because everybody's, in, you know, federal officers are enlisting. And, and Turner actually complains about this early on when he's first forming his company because he says that a federal recruiting officer has stolen a couple of my men, and so I want to know, Governor, it, when these men enlist with me, <laughs> is it okay for the Army to come take them? Uh, and the answer to that is no, right? Um, but uh, yeah, so it, it definitely depends by county. And then if you look at counties like, um, you know, I've looked a little bit at Marion County because it's close to me in Morgantown, and in Marion, you know, you're so far north and the population is so heavily Union that there isn't a lot for the State Guard to do. Um, you know, there aren't really too many Confederate guerrillas. By the latter half of the war, a county like Marion's pretty safe from the Confederate regular army. So in some of these counties, for sure, the State Guard kind of exists more on paper than it does in reality. So it definitely it definitely depends depends on the county. And, and, and that's why I, I'm still working, because I think it's going to be really important for me to understand, um, you know, how many of these companies are active, how many of them aren't. Yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah. And, and it, you know, and, I mean, because the other thing that strikes me is if you look at this map of where they are, there's nobody here, <laughs> which I find interesting, right? And so that makes me, you know, I don't know why for sure, but that makes me wonder if these are such pro-Confederate counties or they're just so remote. I mean, Raleigh is a remote county, but there's a really big roadway that moves through it, um, uh, the turnpike. So in some of these more mountainous counties, you know, they might just be <laughs> sort of left to their own devices uh, uh, for, for the war. Um, yeah, that's good food for thought.